This video is about data correlation and microeconomic theory. So a lot of students will complain that they think microeconomic theory is divorced from the real world. They think it's something separate out there that exists somewhere in the clouds where academics in their hilltop offices like to design worlds that don't exist. And people tend to contrast that with statisticians or econometricians who work with data. But that's actually a pretty incorrect way of viewing things. As a matter of fact, if microeconomic theory is used well, it's going to actually help us think in a more real way about the data correlations that we observe through statistics and econometrics. In particular, it's gonna give us a framework for understanding the possible depths behind those correlations of realities and causal chains that cannot be captured through data. Because data can never capture the full reality of what's inside humans' heads, inside humans' hearts. We know that there's parts of humans that are invisibly motivating stuff that happens in the real world. And that stuff that happens in the real world is what we can measure and put into econometric equations, but we don't want to lose sight of the motivational factors behind the data. So in this video, I'd like to look at some correlations that we observe that are really interesting and fascinating for policy. And I'd like to show you how a microeconomic model can help us think more deeply about the causal forces behind those statistics. And the particular statistics I'd like to look at are the statistics on upward mobility. This is work done by Raj Chetty, who was on my committee in graduate school, and it looks at the neighborhoods where kids are born and how that translates into their income later in life. And he finds these five traits of neighborhoods that are associated with upward mobility. And he measures upward mobility in various ways, but one of them is if a kid is born in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, what's their probability of reaching the top 20% of the income distribution? And these traits are correlational, not causal, so we wanna be thinking about what are the actual causal mechanisms behind them. And those five traits are family structure, which includes percentage of parents who are single parents. It includes income inequality, social capital, which can be measured in various ways, such as number of bowling alleys or number of civic organizations or civic churches. It includes school quality, and it includes how mixed the neighborhoods are in terms of socioeconomic and racial mix of people. And if there's positive things going on in each of these five realms, we see a correlation between that and upward mobility of children who grow up in those neighborhoods. That's the data. So if we see those statistics, our mind might flatten the causal pathways to something like this. And I will say, I, I very much believe strongly that all of these causal pathways are important, and I believe that the elasticities across these policy mechanisms are going to be powerful. But if, if we keep things this simple, we're not going to see a lot of the important underlying factors going on. So, okay, we might see those statistics and think, okay, put more money into the schools, that leads to higher school quality, which leads to upward mobility. That's a causal pathway, I think it's an accurate causal pathway, but there's a lot of other decisions going on. So, um, how does school quality associate with upward mobility? How does that translate? We want to be thinking not only about what the government does, but what a, what the whole community does. What these kids, what choices these kids are making that sort of make this causality work out. Their choices to go to, to college, their choices to pursue certain types of careers, their choices to put off marriage till later, their choices to put off having kids till later. There's lots of choices that are going to translate between this and this. And we want a way of thinking about the internal choices and how that manifests itself, not just the simple correlation here. Housing vouchers, giving people housing vouchers, like the, the program Moving to Opportunity from the 1990s, um, this was where they gave people money and they did this mini, mini controlled experiment and they found that giving low-income people housing vouchers to move to more mixed socioeconomic neighborhoods was associated with upward mobility. And that was actually an experiment that they looked at and found this to be true. So we definitely know that this is a true causal pathway. But it isn't this simple. There were people who were making decisions along the way that um, played in with why, why is each of these elasticities so high. 
and we want ways of modeling the behavior of all of the different people involved. So who are the people whose behavior we might want to think more carefully about? It's the kids who grow up in these neighborhoods who experience upward mobility or not. It's the parents of those kids. It's the communities that decide when to invest in those kids, how to invest in those kids. It's the teachers who interact with those kids. There's lots of people whose personal decisions and personal motivations are going to play a role in all of these causal pathways. So let's model just one of them. Let me explain this model. Models always have a perspective. The perspective is the kid who's grown up in a certain neighborhood who's deciding how many years of schooling to pursue. That's our choice variable. And what are their main motivational factors? There's going to be three that I put into this model. Obviously, there's more than three factors that are going to play a role. This is just me having fun and trying to figure out how some of Chetty's findings might play a role in this decision. So the kid's objective function has enjoyment of the schooling experience and perceived financial payoff from going to school and the hardship that their family incurs while they're in school rather than say working for a living to help out their family or to help take care of kids or whatnot and of course all of these depend on how many years of schooling like if you increase the years of schooling you're going to increase either your enjoyment or your disenjoyment of schooling if you increase your years of schooling you're going to increase your financial payoff and if you increase your schooling, you're going to increase the hardship on your family that you could have alleviated by staying home and working and helping care for the family instead of going to school. And we've got these exogenous factors, which are school quality, percentage of people in your neighborhood with a college degree, and social capital of your family. How many people they know at church, how much support do they have from various members of their community who could perhaps help alleviate the burden of the hardship while you went to college. And of course, it's, it's easy to see why having more people in your neighborhood who, with a college degree might increase your perception that having a college degree is associated with financial stability, financial success. So because every term in a model is going to be from the perspective of the kid who's growing up in the neighborhood, this could play an important role in their understanding of the relationship between schooling and financial stability. And obviously school quality is going to affect a person's enjoyment of the experience of going to school. As a matter of fact, uh, with low quality schools, the experience could be negative. So this is one where the relationship between years of school and how much you enjoy the experience of being in school could be either positive or negative depending on the quality of the school. As a matter of fact, that might be something we might want to graph. So here we have a graph with enjoyment of the schooling process on the y-axis, years in school on the x-axis, and for high quality schools, when quality is high, we might have diminishing marginal utility of schooling in terms of your enjoyment of the experience of going to school. And of course, you could play around with this. Maybe this is increasing a little bit out here. Um, that probably depends on a lot of things, but I'm gonna just keep it simple and have that diminishing marginal utility shape. Because for me, at least, I really loved, for example, my freshman year in college, and I loved my sophomore year. And by, by the time I was a senior, I was I loved it, but there was definitely diminishing marginal utility, at least for me, of, of schooling. And um, for the lower quality school, actually, the relationship is negative. And of course, it could be diminishing at the margin because after you've been there a while, even if you don't like it, you might just sort of get used to it. So that's my argument that this might be some of the shapes involved. Now, of course, since Q, Q isn't just high or low, there's different levels of quality. So maybe for really good schools, this, this shape is really high. For medium schools um, that are pretty good, the shape might be somewhere in between. For bad schools that aren't quite as bad, maybe it's you know low but not quite as bad. So Q is allowed to be continuous. And so this is just me thinking through the relationship between these three variables, Q, Y, and E in my graph. Now, of course, we want to be thinking about policy and how policy can translate into, um, into this decision and how, how it might play out to lead to the statistics that Raj Chetty finds in his studies. And of course, we can build that in by saying, okay, the quality of the schools depends on funding for schools, funding from the government. And now we have this interesting causal pathway that 
Uh, funding influences school quality, which influences the student's enjoyment of school, and that's going to influence their choice about years of school to pursue through these mechanisms. So we've built a more complex uh, way of thinking about what's going on behind those statistics. Now we can do the same thing over here. As a matter of fact, let's draw a picture of this graph. So I'm just exploring the ideas and exploring what are my beliefs about what might be going on. And of course, you're going to try to validate your beliefs through other data. When you, when you run into how much does this rotate, what's the shape of this graph, you inform it as much as you can by data. So here we have the relationship between years of school and financial payoff of the education. And of course, if you have a lot of people in your neighborhood who have a college degree, you might have you. It might be more salient to you. You might um, perceive a higher financial payoff than someone who doesn't have those people in their neighborhood. Now, most people probably know that there's a positive correlation between financial payoff and years in school. Um, it's just if you don't know anybody who's been to school or don't have interactions with them where you sort of see the result of their success and how it affects their life, then um, you might not realize how, how much this, this, there's a payoff. So I've drawn this one where there's a small um, rotation in the graph between having a low percent who've graduated from college and a high percent who've graduated from college in your neighborhood. And this just reflects my personal opinion that um, I think this is a factor, but I don't think it's as big of a factor as this might be. Now I could be wrong, but I've expressed that opinion through the shape of the graph and that can be now either validated or invalidated. This is the hypothesis stage when we're interacting with data in the world. And of course we can do the same thing here where where we can put a government policy uh, variable in here. So the government has vouchers to help low-income people move to more mixed-income neighborhoods, and that voucher is going to influence the percent of people in these kids' neighborhoods who have gone to college, and that, of course, is going to influence their perception about the association between college and schooling. So we're putting in the government variable into this model where it, it's contextualized in a way that it's not if you're just looking at the correlations. So finally, let's do the social capital graph. All right, so here we have our social capital graph where we've got hardship that the family experiences as a function of years that the student spends in school. And of course, this is collective hardship accumulated over time. And as you raise the social capital, give them more connections with their churches, with their communities, with their neighbors, such that they have people they can rely on, that's gonna reduce the hardship of the family and make it easier for the kid to go away to school and spend time studying rather than taking care of children and working to earn money to support the family. Now, what kinds of government strategies could influence this? Well, that's probably a question that's beyond this particular video. In this video, I'm really trying to help you think about how microeconomic theory connects with building a worldview that's more complex and that captures sort of internal motivations of people to understand correlations that we encounter as we do statistics. So if you think that microeconomics is this unrealistic thing where we're doing these thought experiments that are not at all connected to reality, my hope is that you, you realize that microeconomic theory is how you understand reality in a more complex way, that it's not just this causes this causes this, that there's relationships that have curvature to them. There's relationships that are more complex in the way they interact with things. And if you build this kind of thinking into your understanding, your worldview is going to evolve as you encounter new data in a way that's flexible and powerful and actually much more connected with reality. So I hope you found this helpful and fun, and I hope you're enjoying learning microeconomic theory.